Welcome to the podcast. Our guest today is Ed Williams, a civil engineer turned environmental advocate. Ed recognised the inadequacy of existing sustainability efforts in tackling our ecological problems. Determined to address the root cause, a decline in vital ecological systems, he founded the LEHR Garden. This groundbreaking initiative aims to rebuild life-sustaining ecologies while ensuring economic viability. Join us as we explore Ed's journey and his innovative approach to creating a more sustainable future. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. This week I'm actually talking with Edmund Williams, although from the States, uh, from Arizona. And Edmund's here to tell us all about Lear Garden. So Edmund, tell us a bit about yourself. Um, so I'm a, uh, I guess the the, 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 quite, the the easiest way to describe how I got where I am is um, by profession, I'm a civil engineer, but my hobby is engineering with ecosystems. Um, and you know, it's one of those things where as we started, as my profession started moving towards sustainability, I started seeing some of the things that you can see, I've, you know, a little bit, I've got a terrarium right here that I, where I play with, with building ecosystems that, that self function. And, you know, as, as we started like looking into sustainability and trying to really understand where, um, where we needed to go to create something that's sustainable, I realized that the, some of the engineering that I do with with ecosystems actually works in the built environment too, and I started kind of playing around there. So, is that helpful? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, um, mate, tell us a bit more about so the, the Lee Garden. Like, I, I know when I first started some research, research and stuff like that, um, we were sort of getting compared to a bit more of an aquaponics sort of type garden. Can you tell us a bit more about that there? That's a kind of where I started. I mean, when I when I first moved down to Phoenix, Phoenix is a is a really brutal growing environment. It gets up to uh, 100 degrees, or about 115, 120 degrees pretty regularly in the summertime, which I think is what 45 Celsius somewhere around there. Sounds um, hot, mate. Them too, so. it's, it's hot. It's really <laughs> hot. And so it's it's one of those things where some in some cases you got to water a couple times a day and. You know, I had just found out about aquaponics and was really kind of itching to do some experiments. But I'm a, I'm a soil guy. I mean, e ecosystem guy, um, you cannot throw out the soil. And so I, I wanted to see if I could make something that was going to be as automated as possible, um, something that was going to work in the heat. Um, but we, you know, we, of course, we can grow all the way through the winter because we have super mild winters here. Um, but then also something that was going to play with some of the functions of aquaponics uh, but without what well, was still using the soil and it uh just in the first year it did some things that that i really wasn't expecting and you know like first of all i, I have a, a bit of a moral problem with buying soil because everything turns into soil as it decomposes so um i was really looking to um buy you know to like, like okay I, I got a tray i'm gonna try my system out i came up with a design and you know like what can i throw in there without having to actually buy soil and i had a bunch of spent mushroom blocks and um you know they hadn't produced and one of them was about nine months and the other one was about six months that they hadn't produced anything and you know they are i'd already gotten several flushes and you know i put them in this tray that's only six inches deep in full sun in uh phoenix arizona and and it uh uh it was J june when i first planted it which is really our hottest month um, and we all know that, you know, mushrooms, if you, I don't know if you've ever tried growing mushrooms, they don't like most of the ones that we have in cultivation don't like extreme heat. So I figured if there's anything left, it was going to roast them. Um, and I set up this system and it, it kind of was set up like a, like an aquaponic system. And, um, it did pretty well through the summer and then October hit the temperatures dropped. Um, and all of a sudden mushrooms started popping up and I'm like, okay, something, something interesting is happening here. And then the following summer, uh, June hit, and I had my boss sent me on a two-week training seminar out of state. And um, the most I could find, I didn't have anybody uh, who could uh, um, take care of the garden for me. So you know, the, I, I had somebody just stick their head out three times a week and just look at it: is anything flooding? Is anything drying? Is anything dead? Um, and if any of those things happen, give me a call. And for two weeks, I didn't get a call. I get home. Everything was great. It was, it ran itself through the hottest part of the year. Um, with all I lost was two clover plants that 
died because of the heat, not because of the, you know, lack of functioning in the garden. So, and I started really kind of looking at it from the standpoint of like, what is going on here? And that was about 10 years ago uh, when I first built my first one. And, and it, uh, I have gone through a lot of iterations on design, uh, functionality, uh, stuff like that. And basically um, where we're at now is, is something, the reason I call it a Lear Garden and not just aquaponics is because it, it isn't aquaponics anymore. Um, I don't, we don't actually need fish the fish are, are not an integral part of, of, uh, we put fish in it typically to, uh, help manage the mosquitoes. Um, but generally speaking, um, most of my customers don't want to mess with fish. I've only ever had a couple who were like, Hey, I'm going to put some tilapia in here and, and, you know, we'll grow fish as part of it. Um, but it actually does really well without fish. Um, it's just, it's the, the living soil is really the, where the magic is at. My wife would really enjoy that because um, our aquaponics, we run goldfish and um, she's like, fish are friends. We're not eating our friends. <laughs> yeah. And I tend to put goldfish in too. Is there, there, if you keep them shaded, they'll survive the heat of the summer and they definitely survive the cold of the winter. So they're pretty tough. Yeah. That's one thing we really noticed like where we are in the Northern Rivers is, um, you know, my whole concept of aquaponics was, yeah, like we could go away for weeks and one of the biggest struggles in our life right now is, you know, going away and someone look after the dogs and the animals and all that sort of stuff. And um, aquaponics is one of those things. You put a fish feeder in and you just look after itself. And yeah, we actually lose a lot of water. Um, yeah. Just from evaporation basically. Um, yeah. 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 From aquaponics. So I was actually amazed after the, the years I've done it of how much water you lose from evaporation, um, mm -hmm. which is pretty crazy. So Yeah. Um, so wait, did, so you tell put us a float what, valve in it. So um, it'll no, so it'll keep no, itself topped off. No, no, it, it doesn't. Yeah, it's um, okay. in a temporary spot at the moment, and that was temporary five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I know how that goes. So, um, so yeah, it was temporary five years ago, so it's still there. So, um, it's funny, we had some concrete work done, and actually, we concreted around the aquaponics. So, um, yeah, that little garden bed. So, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> should have really moved it and got the concrete down and put it back. But yeah, um, yeah. I, I think to my, my thinking was if I get it on the, on the concrete and that's where it's going to live, um, it's going to have all that thermal mass from the concrete heating it up and cause a whole other heap of headaches in summer, you know, so yeah. for the poor fish. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So, mate, so tell us what does LEHR stand for, for the guys listening at home? It's uh, linking ecosystem and hardware for regeneration. Uh, cool. So basically what, what we're saying is that, that uh, you know, if you look at, if you look at the, there's a lot of people who have recognized that industrial agriculture isn't doing us any favors. And a lot of people have really tried to, to analyze the problem and understand what are the problems, what are the solutions. And a lot of people have come up with a lot of different um, solutions to it. And I, and, and I want to be clear, um, I don't really think any of them are wrong. Um, we, you know, we don't need a, a silver bullet to fix everything. Um, but if you look at, at those solutions that they've come up with, almost every single one of them has either said technology is the problem. We're going to go towards the ecosystem, which is where you get agroforestry, permaculture, holistic management, a lot of different things like that. They say, get the technology out as much as you can use mother nature. Um, and then you've got the other side that says mother nature is a problem. All diseases come out of the soil. So we're going to get this nature out of it as much as possible. And we're going to push it towards um, uh, technology, which is where you get vertical farming, hydroponics, aeroponics. To some extent, I think uh, aquaponics is, is, is a little bit uh, less extreme on that. Um, but most in, in most cases, they're trying to go either one way or the direction or the other. With the Lear Garden, we're using both. We're saying we're going to use the ecology to a very high level. We're going to use the, the hardware to a very high level. We're eventually moving towards Internet of Things for gardening. We're not quite there yet, but we're using timers and tanks and, and beds and, and constructed filters and, and all kinds of things. But then on top of that, um, we're creating this really incredible, vibrant soil that builds itself in place while the gardens are running and, you know, so you have this incredible community of, 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 of uh, soil organisms that are really creating um, 
the ecology that we need. We have got like, it's a full complete ecosystem. And so what we're doing is instead of using the technology to replace the ecosystem function, we're using the, eco the, the technology to enhance and accelerate that ecosystem functioning. Um, and then, um, so that would be the linking and, you know, we get the ecosystem and the hardware, they're, they're working together, they're linked together and then for the regeneration. So the, it is designed to be, um, a form of regenerative agriculture that's going to work. I need to work anywhere, but, but really it's designed to solve some of the problems of urban agriculture. Yeah. So Urban's for me is one of those things that I think um, over the years that I always think, especially with what I do, helping people go off grid. Mm -hmm. um, I think just by default, people that have that mindset and attitude that go off grid and go be self sufficient in the middle of nowhere, they're not actually they're they're fine because you know they're gonna go live off grid, be self sufficient, yeah. and they're, yeah, they're already on that mission. They to make of yeah. So I think one of the biggest things for me that's why I like you know taking houses off grid in the middle of cities and in urban environments because I think that's where the biggest impact can make because I know it's, there's a lot of people that listen to the podcast or follow us on YouTube and that, that live in the city and have this dream of going off grid in the middle of nowhere thinking that's going to be the solution but I think there's so much we can do in urban environments and, and especially with products like yours of how we can um, you know accelerate growing and yeah. grow a lot more from a lot less basically. Yeah, I think uh, there's a couple of reasons to to really push on on that, you know, kind of expounding on what you're saying. You know, first of all, you know, the the I was on a, a resilience fellowship a couple of years back through the uh, Arizona State University. And um, one of the things that they were they said that, you know, went through the research and they found that if you want to be truly resilient, having a community around you is the best way to do that because you know you've got all your food you've got your weapons you've got your land you've got your off-grid equipment and then you break your leg and what are you going to do you know it's 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 having that community of people where you have a diversity of skills and people who are willing to work together and build that community is where the best form of resilience is is going to be and you know let's see if we can figure find a way to turn an urban area from, you know, if, if something, God forbid, happens, you know, uh, from a nightmare hellscape into, into something where everybody can just lean on each other and, and, and pull through. Um, that's, that's, I think, where it's at. Yep. Yeah, totally. From my sales training days when I used to train sales guys, we used to have an acronym for team. And uh, I stood for together, everyone achieves more. And, um, you know, I think even with, what I've done over the years with helping people off grid, I see a lot of people go off grid and go alone and realize how much hard work it is. And mm -hmm. you know, I've seen plenty of divorces over the years and people selling up and so stuff because it was all way too much hard, all too hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that I think people realize of how much support we do get from the community and as a community, how much we support mm -hmm. each other. So, and um, I, and I I think also in a in a in an urban area, what you have is an opportunity of uh, if you can create a life for people that's going to make them more resilient to whatever changes are coming down the road, um, and then you know be like improve their life now, but make them more resilient. You know when stuff happens, you've got those those people aren't you know, aren't going to be part of the problem. They're going to be part of the solution. And, yep. you know, it's, it's just going to be better for everybody. we got a lot more people here in the urban area and we've got to find a way to bring in more people and um, make it a better world, you know? Yep. Not totally. So, but so, okay. So for the people listening at home, can you paint a picture of how the gardens work? Like someone imagine like, yeah, the, the concept and then yeah, what it looks like and how it works. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, um, what you have is, um, a, sorry, I was just thinking you, you've got, you, you wonder if you could bring up a website and see if we could find a picture on there somewhere did, did yep. you, or Instagram. Maybe it might be a little easier uh, to describe with a picture. Um, and that one was, wait, cool. Oh, got the homey website. Yeah. That one's a, that's a, come down a little bit. Yeah. That, right. Come back up a little bit. There's it's um the one you can see the tank right right next to me wearing the green shirt there. No, the one down 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 and oh, yeah, that one. 
That yeah, one. so yep. that's a that's a pretty good pretty good example here. Um, so this is a this is a bigger bed. So we've got a couple different sizes that we do, but the design is is pretty similar. Um, so what happens is um, at the far end on the right there, um, where you see that white pipe, that's that's a compost bin. So this one was built at uh, the Clark Park Community Garden in Tempe, Arizona, and um, the uh, we actually gave them a fairly big. They've got a, a, a CSA there. Um, they've got a fairly big community garden, so we gave them a pretty big um, uh, compost bin, and uh, you, you put food waste in there, plant waste, anything that comes out of the garden. It all just goes in that compost bin. Um, and when the water turns on, it flows into that compost bin first as the, as the water, um, as the compost breaks down, which it does really, really rapidly. So there's no turning, um, in the compost as my, as my business partner's fond of saying, uh, a Lear garden compost works the way that everybody else thinks compost works, but it doesn't, which is you just throw stuff in there and it goes away. Um, that's literally how it works. So what happens is the flow of water, the, the, you know, was it turns on and off, um, oxygenates the compost it moistens the compost and then the water kind of drains away and so any of as the as the the nutrients are are broken down through the composting process whether it be earthworms we get a lot of black soldier flies that have gone wild here um they're they're just sort of, sort of i don't know that they're native but they're definitely endemic um and so they go in there and like you know this this i find that these these compost bins actually process compost um faster than a tumble tumble composter does you know you throw especially if you're putting a lot of uh high nitrogen stuff in there it breaks down really really rapidly um and so as that as the the uh the nutrients are released it's picked up in the water as it flows through which then flows through the bed so the bed is the the the, the garden bed is that main part in the middle there um and we start with almost 100 percent wood chips um, we've got a couple of amendments that we'll put in there. Um, biochar is one that we really like to put in. Um, I've played with a couple of different things and, and you know, still continue to do so. But for the most part, you don't really necessarily need a whole lot more um, than, than the wood chips. Um, you know, we just get, uh, we've got a couple lo local organizations that are, you know, uh, tree trimming services or utilities that, that end up with wood chips and they just give us, the wood chips for free um and so we put it in that we we let, put that in there if we've got food waste available i'd love to put that kind of in the middle of the layer um the bed itself is only a foot deep um and then we we finish it off with um about an inch of finished compost the stuff that we take out of the garden which i'll come back to that in a minute um but the basically the so we, we want a plantable surface some something that the plants can can thrive in rather than just trying to plant in wood chips they don't tend to do very well with that so just about an inch of finished compost on the top and then what happens is as those you know you get the ebb and flow of water that that keeps it evenly moist keeps it oxygenated and you get mushrooms that grow in there um certain times of the year you know phoenix being as hot as it is, we can't grow much by way of mushrooms in the summertime, um, but certainly in the wintertime, planting them in October, November, um, you can get a lot of different kinds of mushrooms that will grow in those wood chips and they'll help break them down really, really rapidly. Then we get earthworms that help cycle that through. Um, and then you just get this huge proliferation of um, uh, soil organisms, um, just the, the full complete soil ecosystem happens there. And because they have those, those wood chips are all an incredible food source for them. So they just grow really rapidly. Um, and then we actually plant it. We don't even have to let it break down. We'll plant it the same day we build it, build it. Um, and the plants just do really, really well with it. So, you know, we plant the garden. Um, and actually we like to plant it really, really dense. I've, I've done some playing around and I like to, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, square foot gardening. Um, it's des designated as a, as a intensive garden system. And I typically plant about three times as densely as, as the, uh, square foot garden you know what, what i'll typically do is plant different things at different layers of you know so that they're because the only thing they're really going to compete for is sunlight um they're going to get lots of nutrients from the compost they're going to get lots of nutrients from uh the wood chips that are breaking down um and you know if you've got any fish in the tank they'll get nutrients from there as well 
Um, and so the, the, the bed itself has a little bit of a slope. This bed probably drops about a foot from the back down to towards the, the foreground here. Um, and the water just flows through the bed, kind of slowly drains back down to the tank where whatever water you haven't used uh, just gets recaptured. Um, and then, um, the, you know, there's a pump on a timer um, and turns back on a couple times a day and just recycles the water through it. Um, so the only significant, so it's, it's automatically fertilizing, it's automatically watering itself. Um, it's, uh, the fertilizing of course happens from the, from the compost and the breakdown of the wood chips. Um, the watering happens through the, through the mechanics of the system. Um, it's, uh, um, so it doesn't need any chemical inputs at all. No fertilizers, no pesticides, no herbicides. We plant a big biodiversity so that you get, so you're drawing in the beneficial insects and, and birds and lizards and stuff like that, that are going to help take care of the pests. Um, diseases aren't usually a problem just because the, the health, the, the soil is so incredibly healthy. We get a little bit sometimes when, when the plants are stressed out by season change and finishing up their life cycle, but that's about it. Um, and then basically, um, the, the soil itself breaks down in place. So the wood chips themselves turn into a rich finished compost like soil in about a year. Um, you can swatch and swap, swap it out. Um, I've actually just finished swapping out one that was only four months old. Um, usually I like to wait to about six months. Um, but, but sometimes you can do them a little quicker than that, but you really have to swap it out by about 12 months. Um, because what happens is the, the soil as it, you know, those wood chips are kind of fluffy and as it breaks down, it compacts down and the particle sizes get smaller and smaller. Um, and then, um, what ends up happening is, um, you get this sort of, it gets, it sort of compacts and it gets really dense and the water doesn't flow through it. Then it goes, because you've still got that heavy organic matter, it starts to go anaerobic and then the plants start to suffer and the, the vitality of the whole system suffers. Um, and so for a garden like this, it's going to take about probably about three or four hours to pull all that soil out, replace it with wood chips and, you know, put the top on, on it and get it replanted. Um, something like that depends. A lot of it depends on how efficient your sifter is. I, I had a, me and a, 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 uh, one of my employees reset this one. It took us five hours because I was sitting there with hand shaking the sifter. Um, it was a pain in the neck, but the, 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 the cool part about it is, um, you know, when I first did this, um, you know, trying to figure out what to do, you know, the very first one that I built 10 years ago, um, it, it worked really, really well the first year. And then it struggled the second year and it was, it was six inches. So I said, okay, well, let's get it up to nine inches. Did the same thing. Got it up to 12 inches. It, it did the same thing. And I, I was, I got it up to 18 inches, so a foot and a half. And, you know, it's, it just kept running into the same problem. And I kept trying to figure out ways to do it until I finally figured out, I've got to pull the soil out and um, I really have to pull it out, sift it. The, the big chunky stuff, the wood chips just go right back in to continue breaking down. Um, the, I've got a two, two way sifter right now. That's a three millimeter. It's got a six millimeter sieve and a three millimeter sieve. And um, the, the stuff that goes all the way. So the stuff that doesn't go through at all is wood chips. It just goes back in as bulk. Uh, the stuff that goes all the way through is this really fine, beautiful, mostly earthworm castings. Um, and that's kind of this finished soil that's that's really the product of it. And then the stuff that goes through the six, but not the three, um, that's the stuff that we put back on as the top. Um, and the, the part that's been really interesting over the last couple of years is um, what we can do for our customers. It's, it's you know, it's a really really easy garden system to maintain except for that it's it's hard for even though it's only a couple of hours of work and you haven't been doing uh you know hours and hours of work all year long it still is intimidating to people and so what we do is we say hey we'll come do it for free we'll just take the soil with us we get paid in the soil and then we turn around and we sell the soil um because it's a it's the more tests we get back, the more and the more research we do, the more we're realizing that that not only is the soil here a, a unique product, but it's possibly some of the most incredible compost that you'll ever you'll find anywhere. Yeah. 
Awesome. Because so, it, it, sorry, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, just because the, the one thing that's unique about it is that it's the only compost system that you'll find that actually has living plants growing in the soil while it breaks down. Yeah. Um, and that creates a whole different biome, a whole different set of compounds. Um, it's cool stuff. I'll put no, it that Totally. Way. So how does the aquaponics and the water and the compost, how does that all interact and the water gets rid of the garden? Um, so the, I guess the, the, the part that was interesting to me, um, and tell me if I misunderstood your question, but, um, one of the things when I, when I very first built my, my first system, I actually had an aquaponic system first, and then I got the soil system built on the same, same one. And the, the aquaponic system, uh, the, the, the water in the area where I was is very hard. Um, and I was fighting like heck to, to keep the pH under nine, um, which, you know, if you know anything about, about aquaponics, you really don't want it too much over eight. Um, yeah. And I was, I was hitting 9.2. Um, I was putting about a gallon of muriatic acid in there um, a week, um, every week, week, week and a half, just to try and push that pH down into a reasonable range. And the reason was that all of those calcium salts were coming in with my tap water. Water evaporates and leaves the calcium salts behind. And what I found when when I hooked up the first Lear Garden was that within about one day, um, the pH neutralized to 7.0. It stayed at 7.0 for about a month or two and then it started to kind of rise and it just leveled right off at about 7.4 to 7.6 um, which is actually a, a pretty good zone where you want annuals um, it actually worked really well there um, and what i found over the years was that um you know so the the two of the big problems that you run into with aquaponics um and the the water quality is that you've got to test your aquaponics almost daily um, because if you get, if you get out of, out of a certain fairly narrow range on your water chemistry, um, your plants and your, and your fish start to suffer and, and that causes problems. Um, and likewise, if you have a fish that dies, it causes an ammonia spike that can kill the whole system for you. Um, and what I found was that a Lear garden had this incredible ability to buffer. Um, not only does it maintain the chemistry within a fairly narrow range, but it also actually buffers, like if you get a fish that dies, um, then what will happen is like as it rots, um, it, it puts a lot of uh, various compounds in the water, but especially ammonia. But when you pump them through a Lear Garden, those get 100% absorbed. And so, you know, I've, I've found dead fish that had been there for like, if I get like set, you know, a whole bunch of fish die, like a, a an aerator kicks out and, and you lose them all, then yeah, that causes problems, but not in the garden, the garden itself. I'll actually take the, take them out of the tank and put them in the garden. I don't even remove them from the system. Um, you know, the garden will just, will just manage it. You know, if you lose all of your fish, in an aquaponic system, you lose all your plants because there's nothing left to feed them. In a Lear garden, that doesn't happen because the the, the soil there has the ability to uh, produce its own nutrients. And likewise, if you get a bunch of nutrients in the water, it'll get um, it'll get just get buffered out by by the soil itself. So it's it's been very interesting. It just being something that's a whole lot simpler to operate i actually almost never test my water anymore i haven't tested anything in like a year i should i really should but i haven't <laughs> research and development <laughs> yeah and i'll tell you right now i am a really good engineer i'm a terrible scientist <laughs> i'm really bad at measuring and i'm really even worse at writing it down <laughs> so uh you just you get put in a habit so you know it's the same 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 so you get those statistics nice. so hire somebody else um, for that yeah when, when, when all the plants die you can go check it then <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's normally how i operate it's like well if something stopped working or it's all dead i'll, I'll go have a look now so yeah. um interesting yeah okay so yeah, it's, it's, um i was having a chat with a guy last week thomas and thomas actually makes um he's the founder of a company that makes nuclear um, power plants in shipping containers 
Mm-hmm. And one of the things him and I talked to, and it's something that I'm really passionate about is, you know, what we were talking about is, is ammonia and how much um, how much energy actually goes into making ammonia for fertilizers. Um, and, you know, I can't remember the statistics, but um, I think we'd need three to five times the amount of land to grow our foods if we didn't actually use industrial fertilizers um, because of, yeah, with how much food we grow and be, because mm. of the the fertilizers we use these days, if we didn't use the industrial fertilizers to feed the whole population, we'd need a lot more um, a lot more land to sort of feed everyone. Mm-hmm. So what sort of production could you expect to get out of a garden bed of this size? Like how big is that garden bed? We can see in the picture there. Um, this one is, and I don't have a handy converter on me, uh, but this one is, is actually the, the biggest one that we build. It's four feet wide. Um, The reason we do four feet wide is it's a little, what, about a meter and a third, give or take. Um, And the reason we do the four feet wide is because um, uh, too much wider, at this point, you know, at four feet, you have to, you have to have access to both sides of it. Three feet, you can reach all the way across. A meter, you can reach all the way across. Um, Four feet, you need, you need access to both sides. But if you get too much wider, it starts to get a little bit unmanageable. Um, It's 24 feet long, which is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of eight meters. Um, 7.3. Okay. Um, So the reason we started with, with uh, the 24 feet long is I, I I had one um, years ago that was 40 feet long. And one of the things that was happening was I, I was, I had some uh, plants that were growing really slowly and kind of struggling. And so I decided to do a little bit of a stress test and I loaded up the compost bin with a bunch of uncomposted chicken manure, probably about two cubic feet of it. Um, And then I added in, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, and, and I watched it and none of the, none of the nitrogen came out the other end. And I said, okay, well, let's go clean out the refrigerator. So I, I threw a bunch of dairy products in there, a bunch of meat, a bunch of, um, again, high nitrogen stuff. And none of it ever came out the other end. And so I'm like, okay, well, I, I don't know what else to do here. And then I watched it. And what happened was it got a growth curve. It just, it, it grew like, like the, the first several sections of it grew really tall and then it just sort of tapered off and then the, the tail end um, was growing a little bit slowly. And that, and that growth curve happened right at 24 feet. And so we said, okay, as much compost as you're going to put in there, it's always going to get filtered out by 24 feet. So there's really not much reason to do it longer than that. Of course, the other problem is that with the slope, if you do it too much longer, you know, you've got your you know, your, your rise yeah. starts to get a little, you know, you're working in a garden that's this tall and it's, it's not a lot of fun. So yeah. um, that's the reason that we, we hold it to, to those dimensions there. Yeah, awesome. Okay. So it's about 1.2 meters and about seven and a half meters. So yeah. Interesting. Okay. And so and how, how productive, like how much food could you produce out of that for, you know, a family living in an urban environment, how much food do you reckon they can pull out that on a weekly basis? So, um, the, that's basically something that I'm still trying to figure out. That's that we're, you know, we've got an urban farm that we're building 12 of these in. Um, the problem is that I'm, I'm a terrible farmer. I'm an absolute terrible farmer. It's part of why I build something that's going to be as automated as it is. And, um, you know, my, my, uh, the calculations that I've run from the numbers that I've done is I think a really easy conservative estimates is about four pounds of food per square foot there. Um, which I don't know how that's going to translate to metric. Sorry. But, um, you know, the, to, for, for reference, I, I, I found a, um, uh, a study out of New Jersey, I, I'll, I'll give you some of the measurements that we have done and let's see if that helps. So there was a study out of New Jersey that studied small mixed use urban farms. And they said that a reasonable expectation of about, on like 130 farms um, was that you would get about a half a pound of produce per square foot per year. And that's not just growing space. That's the whole farm. Uh, that's assuming that you're kind of maximize the amount of area that you can grow in Um and, uh, you know, work to be out to be about a half a pound per square foot per year. Um, now, I was talking at the time to a local urban farm here in Phoenix, 
uh, run by a, a nonprofit, and they said their their aspirational goal was one and a half, and they weren't coming anywhere close to it. And I actually was was back over there a couple years later and asked their new person, like, "How are you doing on that?" And she just laughed and she laughed. Yeah, that, so one and a half pounds is is pretty um, is kind of a lot. Um, the garden that I had in my backyard in Tempe, um, I ran it on a very rigorous farming methodology that I like to prefer. I like to call benign neglect. Um, like I was really terrible about harvesting it. Sometimes it would take me three or four months to replant it when the season was over. Um, I was missing entire seasons and I still averaged for two years. I recorded everything that I took out of it and I averaged uh, 0.6 pounds per square feet. So I was beating the predictions out of New Jersey without any effort whatsoever. Um, and um, so the, uh, I think, you know, the, the, some calculations that I've run, if you get the farming side of it down, probably in the neighborhood of four pounds per square foot per year is, is pretty, um, uh, pretty reasonable. Um, the, the ones that we build for, um, we're working with the city of Phoenix on what's called the, the Phoenix Backyard Garden Program. And what we're, um, what we're seeing there, we're not getting a lot of data back. They've got some data collection, but, you know, just talking to our people, they're eating out of it every day. Um, it's yeah. not offsetting their food by a lot on a, on a bed that's, that's three foot by eight foot. So that's what, just, just a, about a meter by just under two meters. Um, those are the ones that's what we're putting in. So, so one of these larger farm beds, you're going to definitely eat off of it every day. Um, you'll, you'll produce quite a bit. You're probably not going to offset a family farm, but if you get like four to six of them, then you have an output, you have a, you have a, an urban farm where you can be selling produce. Um, you're going to produce more than you can eat. You're probably not going to produce everything you eat. You're not going to get any cheese or beef out of it. Probably no baking soda, but, um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll still produce a lot, but that's one of the things where I'm looking to, you know, kind of get those numbers dialed down. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, um, you know, so I thought about Thomas before and, you know, there's a lot of energy that goes into make, you know, ammonia for fertilizers and to mm -hmm. grow everything. The other most energy intense thing that comes out of food is the transportation. Mm -hmm. So I see that, you know, with something like this here, zero. yeah, we would literally, um, we don't need to fertilize it and it creates its own fertilizer. So that's all mm -hmm. that energy removed from the system there. And then no transport because, you know, you're walking from your kitchen to your mm -hmm. backyard to grab it or even like community. So and I think it's a big thing people underestimate of how much energy yeah. it goes into yeah. feeders. Uh, it is the most energy intense thing you do every single day is eat, yeah. eat food. Yeah. So Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's and that's actually one of the other places that aquaponics tends to struggle a little bit with calorie dense foods. Um, you know, I, I was talking to one, we've got a, a local aquaponics expert and he was telling me, um, you know, I, you know, they tried corn one year in aquaponics and it didn't work at all. And his, his Facebook post said, we're going to try it again sometime. And I, I was, next time I saw him, I'm like, Hey, did you try it? He goes, yeah, we've never gotten it to work. So, <laughs> um, you know, sometimes I, I've, I know some people have got managed to get, I think it's more hydroponics than aquaponics, but I know some people have managed to get sweet potatoes to work. But, um, you know, the calorie dense crops tend to not do well. I've grown corn in a Lear garden. I've never tried wheat or rice. I think rice would probably do really well because of the water flow. But um, yeah. I've tried, I've got, I've got a jar of sorghum seeds right there. Um, I've got, uh, those were grown in a Lear garden. Um, we've got, we've done potatoes, sweet potatoes, uh, beets, carrots, um, lots of different root crops do really, really well in it. Um, and, and actually I wanted to circle back on your, your comment about the fertilizer. Um, one of the things that, that we're trying to, to see if we can find ways to test is the, um, have you ever heard of a Johnson Sioux bioreactor? No. So it's basically a, a compost system. It's a fairly new one, but there, there's a lot of excitement around it. But basically what it does is it breaks down, it, they, they build a structure that creates a, uh, an internal structure that's where not, none of the compost is more than a foot away from an air source. So that it doesn't need to be turned. And then they just sort of leave it alone for about a year. 
Um, they keep it evenly moist and, and they've got a, a couple different mixes of, of organic matter. And what they found is that the soil that comes out of it has this really incredible uh, fungal to bacterial ratio. And then they take that and then they sift it down and they suspend it up into a sprayer and one kilogram um, sprayed on one acre, which an acre uh, is about two and a half acres and a hectare. Um, so one kilogram per acre is 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 enough to um, reinvigorate um, the biology and the fertility of a heavily degraded uh, um, plot of land. Um, and um, like I've seen studies say as much as like a five times increase in in productivity from the land after you, I mean, a, a kilogram of soil is like this much. It's not a lot of soil to put on, to put on an acre. Um, and so um, I honestly think we've got to find some ways to test it, but I think that we've got something similar happening with the Lear Garden um, in terms of the soil that's broken down very slowly with minimal disturbance, except for the fact that we also have the rhizosphere, the living plants and the compounds that they put in the soil might actually supercharge it even more. And so the, 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 it's, it's not just that we're not using fertilizer, we're a net extreme positive in fertility. You know, we're, yeah. we're absolutely loaded with micronutrients um, you know, we've got test results that we're, we're really, really high on, on micronutrients and, and even the macronutrients are pretty high too. Um, so, you know, yeah, we, we're, we're actually net positive, extremely net positive on the fertility. Totally. And you're still creating a product, you know, that people could actually create income from selling your, your worm castings, you know, at the absolutely. End of the season. <laughs> so and, and and actually one of the things that's really cool about it is um the the one thing I don't I'm still trying to generate numbers I'm still trying to be enough of a scientist to generate numbers on farming but I do have really good numbers on how much soil we can produce because we've been actually actively selling it for about 3 years now and so what what happens is there's enough value and we're just selling it right now as as earthworm castings just because nobody knows what glomalin is you know that we have we're probably the only compost product out there that has glomalin in it which is an absolutely incredible if you know anything about glomalin unfortunately nobody does so it's it's uh it's it's not really doing us any good for for marketing purposes um but just selling it at at ten dollars a gallon um, which works out to be about 1.6 kilograms dry weight, um, is, um, you know, is enough to basically it pays off the, they produces so much of it that, you know, for those bigger gardens, for the smaller gardens, we'll reset it for free because we can cover our expenses plus a little bit of profit. But when you get to the bigger gardens, we can actually meet our expenses on half of the value of that soil. And then the other half can go back to the person who bought it and the garden pays itself off in three years. And if we can establish the value as something even higher, um, because like the, that, that same amount of, um, you know, about, about 1.6 kilograms of, uh, um, uh, Johnson Sioux bioreactor soil. I found someplace online that sells that and then they're selling it for about $50. So, you know, imagine if something can pay itself off in three years at $10 a gallon, you know, you're, you're in the black, you're profitable in one year, um, yeah. at, at $50 a gallon. Even if we get it up to 30, that's still pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's interesting with growing your own food, the, the costs associated. I remember I was at a permaculture talk once and Greg, Greg said, Mike, you know, it wasn't just to me, but it was to the whole room. But he was, um, he said, you always pay when it comes to growing your own food. You either pay at the checkout or you pay at the chemist <laughs> later on in life. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the, the more, yeah. So it's because Rather you can buy a bag of cats for two and, and, and I'll say there was there was a there was a great picture that I took and I shared it with Greg Peterson. Um, there was uh, so you guys call them a chemist, or we call a, a pharmacist. Yeah. Um, and a, or there was a or pharmacy. Um, and I was driving down the road one day, and the the sign on the side of the building said pharmacy, except the the, the light in the P had burnt out, so it said pharmacy. <laughs> Truth in advertising. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so true, so true. So, so wait, tell us. So, was it was it glaucomol? 
Glomalin. Glomalin. Tell us more about that. Okay, so Glomalin is a a soil. All right, so you're familiar with uh, mycorrhizal fungus, right? Yep. Yep. Or should I should I explain that a little bit for your readers, or yeah, can we just, assume? Yeah. Explain a okay. bit about it. Yep. So my uh, there's there's um, a type of fungus that lives in in the soil called mycorrhizal fungus, specifically arbuscular mycorrhizal fungus. There's a couple different kinds of them, but the arbuscular ones are the ones that really do kind of the magical work. And what happens is they're sort of like living fertilizer. What they do is they get out into the soil and they gather nutrients and water and they 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 bring them back to the, the the plant they create these little pipe networks and they transport the nutrients back to the plant um and they, the, the 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 fungus and the plants have the ability to communicate with each other the plant will tell the fungus what it needs and the fungus will go out and try and find it um, they'll actually mine um, uh, the the minerals straight out of the rock particles in the soil if if, if they can't find them elsewhere. Um, and I've, some people have described it as the, the the world's biggest mining operation because it's just just millions and millions of pounds of phosphorus being mined every year right under our feet. And but what happens then is these these mycorrhizal fungus take these nutrients back to the plants, to the root tips of the plants, where they exchange them for sugar. And it's really kind of cool. It works really like a marketplace does. And, and you know, the with with there's there's certain bargaining that happens. And, and actually, one of the things that we found that's maybe a little bit worrying is that when we have a higher concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, the fungus understands that that, car, that sugar was cheaper to make. And so it raises the price of the nutrients. Um, and so there's, there's all kinds of really interesting things that happen there, but, but you got to understand that that connection is a little bit leaky. And so what the, what the fungus does is it glues it shut. It has the soil glue that's called glomalin. Um, and it's a glycoprotein. It's got a protein end and it's got a, it's got a, a sugar end. Um, and what it does is it creates sort of this connection around the plant root. Um, and then that, that connection lasts for about four days where the plant root grows on and it'll just, the, the, the fungus will grow around the new plant root. Um, but also the, the, the fungus needs to be able to create its tissues into a pipe network that runs through the soil it's on microscopic levels. And so what it does is it creates glomalin around the sheath of its mycelium to sort of stiffen it so that it can run run the, the, the pipes through the run the, the nutrients through there without kind of collapsing the cell walls. And so the cool part about glomalin is that once it's the, the fungus or the plant is done using it, it sort of, it's a glue. It's a, it's, it's a soil glue and it sort of balls up in the soil and it creates, it's, it sticks the soil particles together and it creates a soil structure called tilth. So if you have good tilth in soil, it's almost always because you have lots of glomalin. Um, and the part that's interesting is we only just, glomalin is incredibly, incredibly tough. Um, so we, we may, it makes it, uses it for about four days, and then it lasts about 40 years in the soil. Um, it's just incredibly resistant to, to being broken down. It's actually so resistant to being separated from the soil that we didn't even discover it until 1996. Um, and the way they do it, the way they discover it was, was they, they finally like they autoclave, they, they put it in a bath, the soil in the bath of sodium citrate and then autoclaved it repeatedly at like 200 and I think it was 250 degrees Celsius, something like 150, 170 degrees Fahr uh, Celsius, rather 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Anyway, very hot. And they have to kind of like repeatedly do this to, to get it to separate. Um, and so what ends up happening is if you've got the right conditions in the soil, um, it is only, glomalin is only produced on the roots of living plants by micro, by our muscular mycorrhizal fungus. Um, now, there was one study that I found that said that uh, uh, they asserted that if, that it, glomalin is so important to the soil structure that if you want to measure how degraded your soil is, all you have to do is measure the glomalin content. That will tell you what you need. So, so back to what it does. So it's, it's soil structure. Um, it creates the, the kind of that open 
uh, porous porosity that allows the bacterial, the, the, the microorganisms to thrive. It allows the plant roots to penetrate. Um, it allows water to penetrate. Um, it's uh, the single largest component of soil carbon. So, um, you know, in soil carbon, of course, you know, we talk about flooding and, and drought. Um, if you want water to soak in, um, one in percent increase in soil carbon will allow your land to, to absorb 20,000 gallons of water per acre per rainfall event. So it's, um, you know, so that, that soil carbon is really important for water holding, but glomalin also cycles nitrogen. Um, they found that it's really important for the nitrogen cycling process. Um, it binds heavy metals. So the, the, the fungus will actually put any heavy metals that it finds. It'll just stick it into the glomalin where it knows it's going to stay for a very long time and just be taken out of the ecosystem. Um, there's just a ton of stuff. And we're, we're only just scratching the surface. We don't really even know what all it does. But like I said, it's, it's probably about, um, if you look at the stable soil carbon, that magic stuff that makes topsoil topsoil, it's about 30% of the stable soil carbon. And it sequesters carbon too, you know, it's, so it's, it's something that, uh, you know, because it holds it away for up to four decades, um, then, you know, it's actually officially classified as a medium term soil carbon sequestration methodology. So it's an incredibly, you know, and, and, and one of the things too, is like, if you look at industrial agriculture, the way the chemistry works, the way I won't, I won't dig into it here, but, uh, the way the chemistry works, the way the tilling works, it's basically a mining operation where you're mining the soil carbon out of the soil. And, you know, we prop that up and sort of accelerate the process with fertilizers. Um, but ultimately, once that soil carbon is all gone, um, there's really nothing to be done for it. it, it it's, it's, you can't add fertilizers to, to completely dead soil and have it produce anything. And so, yeah. you know, if you look at glomal, it is the most resistant to decomposition of all of that soil carbon. It's plausible that, that really are... Uh, industrial agriculture that's feeding most of the world right now is doing it as a mining operation of glomalin. Yeah. So it's <laughs> it's really important. Totally. And then the, the, when you look at that 40 year sort of number, you know, the sort of the late 60s, 70s, when everything really started getting really heavily industrial agriculture, um, mm. you know, on a global scale. And you see food these days when you buy it from so it's just not what it used to be, you know. So um, this definitely, definitely makes sense where you lose a lot of that carbon out of the soil and you just don't get yeah. the quality of food that, you know, you'll plan to get. So it was one thing for me, like um, when I lived in Sydney, I used to donate blood all the time. Mm -hmm. And the lady said, um, she pulled me in a room and said, Look, we need to talk to you about your iron levels. She said, they've just gone through the roof. You're doing anything different. And I was like, and I literally said, I've been eating spinach, you know, about trying to be like Popeye. And um, she asked how much spinach and I was like, you know, she said, that's not crazy amounts, but your iron levels have gone through the roof. She'd need to watch it because, I can't remember what she said could have been wrong with me. Um, but she said, Iron you Man. Yeah, exactly. That would have been pretty cool. So um, so anyway, she said it's going to go to a point, it's going to go higher and higher and higher, and then you're in trouble. And literally it got to a really high level, but safe high level and just stayed there. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, look, the only real thing I've been doing has been growing my own food, you know, so in my backyard mm -hmm. and making sure my own stuff. And so to me it was like very interesting there of how, yeah, like my iron levels went through the roof because of growing food in my own backyard and consuming stuff that I've grown myself at home and, and uh, in small. And, yeah. and of course the question I've got then is, is the, the numbers that she's normalizing to are those numbers that are current numbers based on a population that's eating um, uh, uh, minerally deficient food. Yep. You know, uh, yep. Maybe, maybe that's not the case. Maybe they have actual clinical, whatever but you know i'm not i don't i don't know enough about that but uh you know it's just it, it it begs the question at least yeah well it's definitely like i think there's some statistic like 80 percent of people are magnesium deficient mm -hmm. uh, because we don't get the right magnesium from the foods and stuff we eat these days so um so yeah i think it's definitely that yeah we've depleted the soils of a lot of good stuff and it required to put as much back in or grow our own food and take control of ourselves. you know um yeah i, I don't see big supermarkets um you know, unless we're willing to pay, I think what it all comes down to, you know, in, in going and looking after the health of the soil. Um, 
unless we're willing to pay for that, you know, because they're, they're about making mud profits and um, yeah, yeah. yeah, not not making sure we eat the best nutrient dense food. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and actually, that's one of the one of the areas that I'm I'm trying to find partners around here to see if we can do some research because you know if 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 you can if we're similar enough to the the soil that comes out of a Johnson Sioux bioreactor where one kilogram is going to incredibly boost productivity on um on a whole acre okay you know i did some some calculations i said if you know okay wheat let's say that you do wheat and you boost productivity by i think i said 20 percent um because there was a study that i found out of china that said you know if you added glomalin uh if you as a foliar spray on orange trees it boosted the productivity in terms of the weight of the fruit the sugar content and the mineral content each individually were boosted by like 20 percent in the yeah. fruit, fruit that came out um and so it's like okay let's say we just boosted by like 20 percent. it worked out to be about 160 dollars an acre worth of increased profit okay now if you're selling my product for ten dollars even if i start selling it for 50 um yeah. you know to, how 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 easy is it to say i'm going to spend 50 to make 160. You know, totally. that, that would be, that would be an easy one. If, if those are the kind of numbers that we can expect, I don't know yet, yeah. but I think that's probably where we're headed with it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you know. Awesome. Exciting. Very exciting. So cool. Well, mate, thank you. Uh, I think we're getting yeah. close to an hour there. So um, well, is there anything you'd like to yeah end on or let people at home know to have a think about when it comes to growing their own food? I think, you know, the, the big thing when you're growing your own food is it's all comes down to the soil. It always comes down to the soil is, you know, yeah, a Lear Garden makes soil at really powerful levels, but that, that really great soil that it's making, put mycorrhizal fungus in your garden, you know, add the organic matter and, and, and grow healthy plants. And um, it's always, it's, it, it's all comes down to the soil. That's where it's at. Yep. No, definitely so. Awesome. Well, mate, well, thank you. And thank um, you. I'll put Edmund's details and contacts below if you guys want to reach out. Anyone in the States wants to get a, a Lear Garden and um, you'll have to watch this space for you'll be able to get one in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still just kind of working in the Phoenix area right now, but actually we've got a couple of potential partners uh, that we're talking to about maybe creating hubs elsewhere where we can kind of get get the get it going and and see if we can grow and and help uh, really improve in uh, urban agriculture. Yep, that sounds good. Thank you. Appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found the content educational and inspiring. If you got something out of it and you think you know someone else that would actually also enjoy it, we'd really appreciate it if you could share the link with them and encourage them to check out our channel. And don't forget, you can join the Off Grid Tribe podcast for free. We can actually ask and interact with myself and also our guest speakers. So jump over today to theoffgridtribe.com, register yourself an account. We can actually have a conversation with myself and one of our guest speakers, and we can continue the conversation there. Together, let's embrace the power of sustainable living.